Hey, fellas. Hey. Want to say hello? Yeah. Come say hello. Hey, hi. Hey, Banjo. How are you, mate? Can you wait? Hey. How are you, Robert? Good, thank you. Very good, brother. Very good. How are you, Pete? Do you get called Pete or is it just Peter? No, I just get called whatever, man. Yeah, Pete usually. It's a bit shorter. <laughs> Especially for us Aussies, we uh we struggle we struggle with extra syllables, eh? Yeah. Name in New you Zealand. Got, you is guys are shocking. <laughs> um yeah, man. We are oh, actually we've kind of lengthened our kids, eh? It's like because we have Ruby, Poppy, and Monty. But they just get called Rubes, Pops, Monts. Yeah, so similar. Mm. <laughs> it's yeah. so Australian to shorten words down and just nickname and try. It's like I love that that movie. Uh, it is Yes Man and the manager in the sales system. It's American, but it, the manager in the sales system he meets the guy and he's like Carl. And he's like, oh, I'm gonna make your name Car. He's like, why? And he's like, because it's a nickname. <laughs> he's like, your name, your nickname's Car. And the guy's like, okay, name's already pretty short, but. We'll go with car. <laughs> so, it's good, eh? No waste of words. No. And I actually think, I'm pretty sure he's a Kiwi. It's based in America, but he's a Kiwi. He's a, he's a guy from uh, Flight of the Concords. Oh, Jer- is it Jerome? Yeah. No, no, he's the manager. He's the manager of the band, the redhead guy. Oh. Um, the band yeah. manager. Ah, what's his name? Reese Darby. Yeah, it's Reese Darby. So yeah, he's hilarious. It's American scene where <laughs> this American guy comes into his office. He's like, "What's your name?" And he's like, "Car." And he's like, "All right, I'm going to make your name Car." He's like, "Why?" Because <laughs> that's what we do. Very funny. Anyway, that's some solid dad humor for you, Mister Cassio, Big Louie. How we doing, fellas? Good, brother. Everything is good. How are you? Mate. How's everyone? Firing. Absolutely firing. On all cylinders. Good, man. Hey, I have a feeling that every time that we speak, you are somewhere else. <laughs> You're never in the same spot, right? Is it oh, correct? Man. Oh, it's actually been the biggest lesson for me this week. I had a massive tiff with Nicola. Um, she's, after a year of being nomads, she's well and truly over it. And yeah, we butted heads about it big time, but we needed to because we've come to the decision that we're going to settle down somewhere. So the year of travels has come to an end, but yeah. Yeah, man. It's hard to stop traveling, right? We are kicking off again. We just sent all the documents to uh, to Australia. We got an hour. We make the final payment uh, tomorrow and we are renting tomorrow house on Airbnb also for a couple of weeks. So we're leaving we going to, we 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 moving around too. Yeah. Very good. Very good. It's all happening. It's all happening. Yeah, man. Hey Peter, nice to meet you, brother. You too, bro. You Stop. too. So where's so where's Just home to at at the here. moment? Uh, uh, I'm Brazilian, but I live here right next to you guys. That you you Australian, right? Uh New Zealand. Ah, uh, New Zealand. Yeah, it's true. I mean New Caledonia. I live in New Caledonia. My wife is from here. Yeah, nice. All right, fellas. Yeah, it's good. Uh, it's good to you. Just wait. What do we got? 7.04. Got one more minute. And then I get Pete to uh, we'll kick off and have a bit of a yarn with Pete. So first of all, while we're waiting for the Adams, the Adams family, <laughs> uh, drop in the chat. What's a what's a macro win for you at the moment? So not a micro win like the week to week thing. What's a macro win on the bigger picture? What's been a big win for you? Drop it in the chat, in the Zoom chat.
the macro wins, bigger picture wins. Dion daily workouts, that's been huge for you, brother. You've been heaps of, heaps consistent with that. Hey, Cassio discipline. I know that's been mass muscle for you, Brent. Muscle gains, six pack coming on strong. Oos. What's a what's a macro win for you, Pete? Um, I'll instead of typing, I'll just say it. Probably just a hundred percent made the decision to homeschool the kids next year. Huge. Which is, I don't know how it's going to work yet, but got to make the decision first. So the how's never important, is it? No. No, you find you find a way. You find a way. If you look back and all all the decisions these guys have always made when they've been like, oh shit, don't know how it's going to work, but they know what. It, um, they know what it is. Yeah, they'll. If you find you, you find a way. You find a way. Always. That's a you know, who is it? Uh, Bob Proctor. Then how is never relevant. You need the what and the why, and the how will present itself. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah. Mister Robert, accountability, feeling healthy because of the diet change. Very good, my friend. Massive, massive changes. And how are you going? You got your training dialed in yet? I don't need, don't need you. Yeah, more or less, more or less. Uh, because I I didn't uh, get the dense strength training right in the in the beginning. Yes. So I started with like ten reps each minute, and I couldn't do that. Um, and now I had to scale down for pull ups, four reps, for example. And that was like in the beginning very hard for me <clears throat> because I thought it's not enough. But after 10 minutes, well, <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it is, it's a shift in mind when you start training dense because the first like five sets are piss easy. And you're like, I'm not getting anything out of this system. But it's like those last, that eight, nine, and 10. If that's where right. the struggle is, then that's where the growth is. And then we, we, we monumentally, or not monumentally, we, we uh, gradually increase that amount, the, those reps. So, so often with previous methods, it's all about hitting fatigue early and getting a work on the muscle. Whereas this, it's about actually consistency, turning up every day and getting those reps in. And then the base, the volume in your body, the capacity gets so strong and so it, it boosts so much that then you're, you're able to handle more, more uh, volume. Mm -hmm. You've got a greater capacity. Like if, if you follow the motion guy, Nico from Bali Time Chamber, watch how incredible he moves. And, and his capacity, he uses dense strength. He trains 15 minutes a day. That's it. 15 minutes a day. What was that? The motion guy? The motion guy. Motion guy, okay. Harley time chamber. To see that man move and his capacity and the the minimal amount of training he does, it's just, it's psycho. Like he's got his tra training dialed so, so, so much. And, you know, his whole method, his whole method is, Get to 10, so you need the base. You need to be able to do 10 sets of 10 on a movement before you can start scaling intensity down to threes, twos, or even ones and, and do really heavy or hard stuff. But get the base of 10s down, and then once you can do 10 tens, then you can start working on like five ones or five threes or even five fives, like hit more of a strength stimulus. But he thinks it's everyone, and he's proven it with – he's got an app with, you know, hundreds of guys that are using the system – He's proven that the, the base, building the base of 10 tens literally gives so much capacity potential when you go to more intense movements. So that's yeah, pretty cool. I'm all I'm so close to cracking 10 tens on dips and pulls. So close. I'm on 10 nines. I got I, I got in the same yeah. 10 minutes, same 10 minutes the other day. I, I hit my B, PB, eight dips, eight pull-ups in the same minute, 10 sets. I was, I was, and I've been sore for three days. <laughs> the bloody good effort. Yeah, it's um, it's cool. It's a cool system to play around with. You guys enjoying it? And it simplifies it, eh? As a dad, like you don't need to go to the gym for hours. You can just have a simple system that's proven to give you scalable progressions and development. You just got to turn up and do the work. Epic. All right, doesn't look like we're getting the Adams to join us tonight. That's all good though. So we'll transfer across to Pete. So the reason I got Pete on tonight, guys, is I've been connecting with him 
through Uncom. So he's a he's a gym owner and a, a strength coach as well. Uh, and so he's got involved with Keegan to develop himself and his business and and grow himself as a coach and, and be connected to that community. And a lot of the dads in Uncom who are coaches or gym owners or health coaches, we're, we're starting to connect and, and we're kind of pulling more, more and more gold out of each other. And I've only spoken to Peter twice and every conversation I've like hung up feeling so fucking inspired by him just being like, you know, like, and he'll, he'll take this very humbly, but he, the, the shit he's dealing with and, and what he's doing and what he's done is, is proper inspiring. So I've got him on tonight just so he can share his, his story what he's working through, you know, how he's managing kids, you know, chippy, you know, builder gym, and then the feats, the physical feats and the training that he's doing as well. You know, it's, it's proper inspirational to hear these guys. So thanks for jumping on, mate. I really appreciate having you on and it's awesome for you to connect. Yeah, no, it's, it's cool. And, and um, same with you two. And it's like, I remember having those calls at lunchtime. I'm like, we're kind of running into work time, and you just want to keep going because you haven't <laughs> haven't shared enough or listened to enough. But um, I guess a good place to start for me is I'm just a country boy. You know, I was, I was the second um, in a family of four boys myself. Um, Dad didn't speak to mum for like three days after the fourth son was born because he really wanted a little girl. Um, but we, we grew up on a farm, so we grew up with with values. And you can you can look at your position in two ways. You can look at your position as unique or you can look at your position as unfortunate. And the unique part about my upbringing was that my dad, he was old. He had me, he had my oldest brother when he was 49, me when he was 50, my youngest, uh, the next one down when he was 54 and youngest when he was 57. So we essentially grew up with like the values of and wisdom of a grandfather as a father. And I took that for granted when I was a kid because it's just that. It was just my dad. I didn't know any different. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, when I become, I always look forward to being a dad and, Honestly, the fucking hardest part to that was like finding the right mum. I don't know if it, how you guys have probably, you obviously found yours somewhere. Um, I don't know if it was the one you thought it was going to be at the start, but um, I was engaged to a girl for a, for a period of time and I thought it was her. She probably had a few demons of her own and she was a bit of an alcoholic and she used to have blades and stuff on the left on the couch because her arms were shredded from just not very good headspace, but we ended up growing into, into flatmates. Um, and there was a lot of shift in my life around about that time because I found out dad had cancer. So then I went, I was working for a bank in Christchurch at the time. And what was the most important thing for me at that time was just being closer to home. So you'll get, you probably get times in your life where you're like, you'll get this feeling like, I just feel I need to, whatever it is, you've just got to act on it. Because if you don't, then that just sits in your gut and it festers and it turns into regret. And you'll <laughs> next time you get that feeling, you'll be like, I've got to act on that because that feeling was shit. So I went home and um, so I spent a bit of time closer at home with dad and, and got into a little bit of running. Um, and, and then I was coming back from a meeting and my my auntie and uncle were at the bank and they were in tears. I thought, oh, fuck, dad's passed away. Um, but I found out my older brother took his own life. And I was like, what the? If you've ever had any type of grief, you there's like a cycle of emotions that you go through. And it's like you feel shock at the start and then you feel confused and then you feel angry and then you feel all this. And it's it really put my life in perspective because it was like, I had, we were 30 months apart, right? I admired the shit out of him and we were like two peas in a pod. And when you get that that male role model in your life just taken away from you, it leaves so much empty space. And then when dad passed 10 months later, it was like now both of my male role models of my life have kind of just gone and I've got two younger brothers looking up to me and I'm like um, the oldest in my, kind of in my blood, and I'm like, shit. Yeah, I feel like a sense of responsibility, right? But like up until that stage, 
my father had taught me all the lessons that I needed to be a dad. I didn't realize it at the time, but he'd already taught me all the lessons I needed to be a dad just from how he was as a dad. Now, he wasn't the he wasn't like a textbook dad where he did all the right things in all the right way, but he adapted and he learned, and um, I respect the shit out of him for how he raised us as kids. Um, but like throughout that time, um, the way I dealt with that was doing something physical for my body and talking. Like if I I just had to get stuff out, I had to share the story. If I didn't share the story, people wouldn't, wouldn't know the story and they wouldn't know what I'd been through or what my brother had been through. Um, and like I was the kid at school that refused to do a speech. At six, and like in sixth form, I think where we had to stand up and speak, I was like, nah, not doing it. Don't like standing in front of people and talking. And the dean wrote a letter home to mom and it was like, Peter's refused to do this. And like, so he ain't going to get me up there. Um, but like when it came to speaking at my brother's funeral, I was the only person that could tell those stories. So I was the only person that could stand up in front of a couple, few hundred people and, and share. And probably that forced uncomfortableness made it made me grow like I, there was no opportunity for me to not grow so as much as i don't like public speaking i love the opportunity to do that part um and with the running um this is probably just an example of of how i do things sometimes with like running was the process and i was running with a mate and we like we do a half marathon cool we'll take that off and it's like a what's next to we always try to up it a little bit. So we did a 36K run and, and my legs were fucking smashed and I was cramping. And I remember I had um, like a rainbow colored hand because I was like carrying these jelly beans and they were dripping out. I was having a few at a time. And and um, it was like, okay, well, what's next? You know, you get from 36K. So it was like, oh, fuck running a marathon because it's just the stereotypical distance that everyone glorifies. And like we just went to ultras. So we booked him for a 60k mountain run and it had a bit of hills in it so we we did a um another run that was 60k's along river about three weeks beforehand that took about six hours and again but the most tired and fatigued i've ever been i was just i was smashed and i'm like now we have to do this with hills three weeks later we do that it was like seven hours 14 and you know you walk all the downhills because otherwise your legs get smoked. And I remember standing in the lake and I'm like, ah, oh, I kind of felt the sense of achievement because I'd just done this run and, and it doesn't matter what the time is, but I completed it. And um, through all the struggle of the day and then we're talking to these, um, these couple of birds in the pub afterwards and we're like you know what's next and and um that already registered for this ultra this other ultra which was 100 mile so 160 k's and it had eight thousand meters of elevation and i'm like scratching my head with my extremely painful legs and feet so i'm, I'm my brain starts to think right it's like so we've just gone this far and i feel like this and you guys have registered for something with an extra hundred kilometers and more elevation. So my my little my little boy brain, I was twenty five at the time. It couldn't handle that information, but what it could handle was, oh, you girls are doing it. I'll give it a crack. So, and that was all it was. So training became relative to my biggest training days. So I was like, I'm going to run to town, and town was eighty k's on the road. Um. Unlike most runners, like I, I took protein with me, meat to eat. Most people take gels and bars and all these type of processed carbohydrate, fatty foods. And like I made some slice with lots of butter in it. And, and uh, um, I think I had a bunch of chicken and stuff. And I'd run for a half hour and a half, not stop, 10 minutes. It took me 11 and a half hours to get there, but I got there. And I did another run. Um, it was like I was going to do 4,000 meters of vertical climbing and it's like a thousand meters up to the hut and back 
and it was like three and a half hours for a trip and I did that four times that day and going up that last climb I, I remember taking a video and done a little wee selfie video diary and the sweat was showing off my face and like the level of fatigue that my body was going through I'd never had it before and I'm like this is only like half of what I've got to do but you get you get past it and then you go and run the ultra took me 38 hours my ITB stopped working the last 60 k's took me 20 hours start to hallucinate um and after 10 minutes of finishing I couldn't I couldn't actually stand up like I was my body was like okay we're finished I'm shutting down I've got to try and fix and I couldn't stand so I had to be humble to get two of the blokes to carry me into the car into the ice bath into the shower into bed because I was I was toast but I did it and my mentality when I was climbing up this hill for five hours in a row with that massive headwind was like one step at a time one step at a time one step at a time so anytime now I have I, th- I have a challenge or I think I have a challenge I look back at what I have achieved in the past and how I've achieved it. And it's literally just one step at a time. And sometimes you can't comprehend everything you have to do, but all you have to do is comprehend taking that next step. And if you don't know how to take that next step, get some guidance to take the next step. Get a little bit of information to take the next step. And that's an awesome part about what Jordan's doing with um, with his dad's thing. And just the simple shit with food. Like there's so much messed up food information out there. It confuses the shit out of people. But unless you take a step to try something, get some feedback from it, you're like, well, this actually makes so much sense. I can't argue with it. Um, Anyway, I've got a lot of stories. We'll be here all night. But can I jump in there? Yeah, man. I want to talk to you because, like, that's no small feat. I mean, like, you say it as if you did it, but like 160 clicks in under 48 hours is it is it is massive feat that you know only a small percentage of the population is ever going to achieve because you know some people will attempt it and never achieve it or whatever but you you did do it so in the preparation for that what was your mentality in the in the preparation for the process right like before the race because i feel like so often we get caught up overthinking the process and i guess maybe it is just that one step at a time again like in the training process but like for instance with where we're at you know with these these guys just getting into training regimes and being consistent and doing that 10 minutes a day minimum 30 minutes daily is the aim what what did you use mentally to turn up time and time again like what thoughts are you going through what mental processes are you using just to call yourself out because so often we're going to face those little demons that pop up and say it's too late or you're too tired you don't have it in the tank. Good question. I, I made a commitment. I made a commitment to train. I made a commitment to the race. And part of it was helping deal with the loss of my brother. So there's probably, there was a, there was a bit of like, I need to do this to get uncomfortable to feel like this is, this is giving me purpose. Unless you've like, how many 25 year olds run ultras or run a hundred milers? Like there was no one my age doing it. They're all in a third or they're all going through the midlife crisis. I went through my midlife crisis in my fucking mid twenties, man. Um, but like in a, in a sense, like I had a plan, like I knew the distance was this far and I had to run it on this date. And I knew that if I did some some speed work some days, some hill sprints, I knew if I did some biking and some running on this day, um, I knew if I um, had some rest days and did some longer stuff on the weekend, it was going to be the best thing I could do. Um, I knew I needed to look after my feet. I knew I needed to look after my stomach with the food. Uh, I, I had to be strategic about my pacing because – if you start too fast, you uh, you're fucked. Like when you start to get to that running, that ultra stage, you have to practice to run slowly. You start a little bit too fast, like that's it. Like you're out there for days, like for a long time, 
Um, and I looked at all the previous lap times and I thought, I'm about this, so I need to come and do this 50Ks in about this time. I need to do the next one in about this time. And for the first two, I was about good. The last one, I blew out just because I was, I was fucked. I was just, I was just rooted. I don't know if that answered the question, but yeah, I mean, so what I got out of that is a big one is purpose, right? So making sure you've got purpose behind your goals, you know, like mm. you lads considering why you're on this call right now, like what drove you to start this program, to start taking responsibility for your health, to start making changes. And be so dialed in on that why and constantly check it in. Like you, you have it just repeating in your head, repeating in your head, repeating in your head, repeating in your head. And the more you can check in with it, your subconscious is creating the result in your mind, men, mental energy. And then that is what influences. You have to be at somewhat possessed with your goal, right? Like if you're not obsessed with that goal, you know, it's not happening. Because if you're not obsessed with it, you'll give up when it's eat, when it gets tough. Mm. The big thing, Keegan, Keegan always says, it's one of the things he's always said to me ever since I started with him years in 2017, be so obsessed with your progression. Like don't muck, don't, don't muck around. Like, oh, I kind of want to get a bit better here. I kind of want to make, you know, my strength better. I kind of want to get healthy. It's like, be fucking obsessed with it. Be obsessed with your health and you will, you will prove so much to yourself just simply by believing in yourself and being obsessed with your goals. Hmm. Like hands up if you've gone half ass at goals before. How shit do you feel? Feel like dog shit, don't you? It's like why do we why do we go half ass? Because our human potential, when we actually go, I'm going all in and I'm not stopping, I'm going to be obsessed with this. That's when you make magic happen. Would you agree, Pete? Oh, shit, yeah. Yep, 100%. Like when we started the CrossFit here, it was like, so we started the CrossFit from our patio and then it got fucking cold. We're doing running and dumbbell thrusters and it was minus five. I'm like, fuck this shit, we need a shed. So we found a shed. We did it in there and then any spare moment I was out there. So I would, like sometimes I was obsessed with getting the gym going and still keeping physical you know, doing my own training. And some days I was heading out there at four o'clock in the morning, training, coaching, going to do earthworks during the day, coming home, doing three more classes at night time, get up, do it again. You're like, then you get to a stage where you're like, oh, fuck, I'm, I'm too obsessed. I'm too obsessed with the shit that's getting bit. My wife had to try to pull me back a bit. Um, but when, when the first child came around, it was like, Yep, cool. Sense of responsibility. Um, have to step up, help out around home. Wow, it probably wasn't help around home more. It was probably provide more, be away, do the do the breadwinner stuff. It was when the second child came. It was when the second child came because mum was with the baby. That meant that my night shift was was with the firstborn. And then when our third child came, mum was with the baby. My night shift was in the first and the second born. And when this next baby comes in April. Mum's gonna be with the baby. My night shift is gonna be the with the first, second, and third boy. Like depends who's awake. That kids are pretty good sleepers because mum's sleep train them really well. But each each baby you get, there's a different perspective shift. And our kids, they're just they're so different. The firstborn, she's quite sensitive, but she's quite creative. The second born, she is a ruthless, relentless little shit that you, you just can't tame it you try tame it you 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 lose every time and the the our boy monty is nearly two he just does his own stuff like he's he's not even two he's off on his trike and he's down the street looking at cars by the pub on the main road and everyone's like who's the, who's the fuck is this kid and you get this call like are you missing the child i'm like yeah is it yeah probably yeah but we give these kids freedom and they respect it they come back they don't do too much stupid stuff. But knowing how your kids learn can be one of the best things that you can understand for your child because that way you know how to communicate with them. 
you can understand when they're communicating with you and you can teach them when they're ready to be taught right kids aren't they aren't gonna do what they're told when they're told and it's just something that my it's going through my head because that's what my parents have told me like do what you're told when you're told my next younger brother down he was in the army he was probably really good at that at home and he's probably done it really well in the army and I didn't really do it so well that's why I'm not really employed at the moment I am employed but I don't operate a business as well um but yeah the best advice I got told as a dad um and which I pass on to dads is your kids will teach you how to be a father they'll tell you what they need at a certain time if you listen to them They'll guide you into fatherhood. That's huge. That's actually a really cool. That's a cool perspective, and that and that comes with enough uh, emotional integrity to call your to cool your guns, right? Because I guess, I mean, I'm going I'm going through a similar thing. I don't know about you guys, but Indy's Indy's two and a half now, and. He's doing the sleep thing where he wants to kick and roll and scream and cry and punch and do everything when he's t- when it's time to go to bed. And you know, I laid there for with him for like an hour the other night with him just crock rolling and crying at the top of his lungs. And there's a part of me that wants to shake the shit out of him, just be like, dude, just go to sleep, you know. But that's that's a part in, in me that I can sense is an ex, you know, it's an old part of me, and I get to watch it now and go like, wow, there's so much. That's probably how I was dealt with by my dad and it's wanting me to come through. You know, he just used to hardcore discipline us and it was like, you get smacked if you don't go to sleep. So now I'm like, take some breaths. I do the box breathing. I do four in, four hold, four exhale, four hold. And after like two or three rounds, I'm in full control of my emotions and I can talk to him and, you know, tell him a little story or whatever. And usually we event, he eventually goes off it. I don't know. It's, it's it's such a big emotional process being a dad. Like as 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 men, we're told that we aren't emotional and we shouldn't be emotional. And you know, everyone says, "Oh, the Stoics this, the Stoics that." Well, the Stoic philosophy isn't being unemotional. The Stoic philosophy is actually observing your emotions and choosing to act with logic instead of always acting out of emotion and so when you have these emotions pop up as a dad what are some processes for instance in your life pete that you've used when you've kind of you're boiling or you're boiling at the surface and one of the questions that i ask myself and if this can be any situation it's like what's the most important thing i should be doing right now What's the most important thing I should be doing right now? And if my child is reacting and losing its shit, it's like if me reacting to my three-year-old's reactions um, with this, you know, reciprocating to that with same anxious, is that going to help? No, it's just going to antagonize the situation. Do they do they just need a cuddle? Probably. Is that going to calm it down? Yeah, well, let's try that. And sometimes it's, it's it. Sometimes you have to do the opposite thing to what you think you need to do and just do what you think feels good. Um, the The challenge is, there's, there's so many the challenge, there's so many fucking challenges as a dad. Like you come home from work and the, it's just a chaotic household, right? Kids are losing the shit because it's almost ten a time or it is dinner time. Mum's losing the shit because she's had enough of the kids all day. So you're walking into this house and the, there's just this... It's like this tensiony, fuzzy stuff, like fly around everywhere. Um, and sometimes all it takes is to pick up one child and go for a walk with them outside and distract them with something different. That way, the energy gets taken out. Mum gets a little bit of time out. And the other two, sometimes that just separates everything. And it's to be able to recognize what that is and just walk in calmly and do it. Does it work all the time straight away? No, it doesn't. Like that's why being a dad, you just have to adapt in every single situation. And if you aren't looking after your your body with your food, 
with your energy, with uh, with your training, with your headspace, with your sleep, you are already behind the back ball. You're already behind the back foot. You don't have the capacity to deal with that shit because you haven't been out, you haven't dealt with yourself. Now, like, sometimes people view selfishness as a bad thing. I firmly believe if you don't look after yourself first, which can be viewed as selfish, which is you have to be selfish, you can't look after anyone else to the best capacity, right? So selfishness can lead to selflessness and vice versa. Sometimes people that put everyone else first, that makes them fall behind with their fitness, their food, their capacity, and they give everything else away, then they can't give a good self to other people. Have you guys experienced that in your journeys? Like you you might see it in other people's situations. Someone that's just like, oh, I, they use the excuse like, oh, I'm going to work. I'm, you know, I'm so busy, so I eat all this shit because I don't have time to cook. I don't have time. I'm too busy. Can't train. I eat this, but I'm providing like a little bit of money to the party. And I'm like, fuck, man. If you just take money off the table, which is most people's excuses in any situation, like what's left? Like, are you contributing time? Are you contributing love? Are you contributing energy? Are you contributing with little chores around the house? Like if, if money is the only thing that you're going out there to bring to the table, okay, that's cool. That helps a bit. But what if we take that one thing away? Wow, that's a, that's, a, that's a powerful... That's a powerful insight for men. Because it's, it's such a big focus on the being the breadwinner, going out and making money, right? It is, it is, it's a natural process for men to want to go out and provide and protect, and it should be. But you're right. If you take that away, that one attribute to what you're providing, what else are you providing? Are you providing a sense of calm, a sense of compassion, of love, of presence. He sent me with a good example. And this is this is the these are the questions that are so important for us to consider. You know, I wanna wanna ask a question now for everyone, just drop in the chat. Out of seven days, how many days on average you reckon you're training? Just put it in the chat, just a number. So got seven, seven, six. If you're missing, what does you mean reckon the training? Oh no, no. How many, how many days are you training? Out of seven. Um, out of seven. Okay. And just put it there if you're missing them. Missing them. Accept it. Put it in. Last few weeks been seven. Epic six. Awesome. Now, if we drop that back to say two or three, which is a big excuse for dads. I can only train two or three times a week. On the days you don't train, does it affect your emotions? One for yes, two for no. On the days you don't train, does it affect your emotions? A hundred percent, man. Like, but, it, and it's not just that so there's the dads, in the house as well but the wives they need their time out from the kids like how, how we run a household here i usually get up at quarter past five um i'll either go and train or if i'm coaching in the morning then i'll coach um i'll get home at 6 30 ish eve my wife she'll go to the gym for a bit she'll have her time in the morning and then i'll start to get the kids up and get food ready and do contribute as much as i can to the morning routine um and then go when she gets home. If she doesn't get to the gym in the morning, she's a different person that day with the kids as well. So by sometimes by me not going to the gym or me sacrificing some time so we can both go, both of our kids get better parents. So it's like how much time are you guys allowing your the mothers or the wives to have by themselves because if you know the easiest part of my day is going to work 
is this part of my day is going to work? And like a lot of blokes are like, oh, yeah, I worked all day. I was sitting there, put my feet up. I'm like, you fucking pussy. Like it's, 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 yeah. The, the woman, I don't know. It's, if how many days have you guys had alone with your kids without the wife? Or how many nights? How many days and nights? Like I, I've probably only had a few. Oh, I, I could probably count on one hand how many full days and nights I've had with my kids. But any chance I get to take them off her, I do. If we're going to do a dump run, I can't just take one. They all come and go run around and climb over the shingle piles and get fucking muddy and then the car gets all muddy. But it's like, why get upset about a bit of mud? Right? Like there's so many, so many things as parents we... We think we we use this this term as like naughty. Oh, that's naughty. Or oh, that's naughty. You shouldn't do that. We we use do. We use don't. We use no. We use stop. Way too many times. You use that probably a child hears that a thousand times or ten thousand times. That they, they're gonna they're gonna stop doing it. They're not even gonna start it. And you'll. You'll just you'll lose them. You'll lose your creativity. You'll lose the the energy because they don't want to be told off. From like, how was a little bit of being a child a bad thing? I don't so know. What, do you, what do you do in replace of that? Because the no thing is is really funny to watch to catch yourself. The way the way I can best describe it is if if you say don't stop and no, like you're you you're trapping your child in a box, right? So let's use the example, don't touch. Just stick them in the box. They're like, but if you if you give them direction, like hands off, you're you're giving them a cue to do something. So I always try and give them like it's this it's the same message, but in a different way. So give them a direction to go somewhere as opposed to just spin them around in circles. Um, what's another example? Don't climb that. <laughs> don't touch that. Don't don't speak. <laughs> don't because because every because now we've had this conversation. You guys have listened to it. Um, if you know, if you hear yourself about to say "don't know" and stop, just think of a way that you can not use that word, or that you can provide a different direction for them to go. Like, I encourage my kids to mess shit up, or like, I'm not the type of person that says I don't want my kids getting hurt. Of course, I want my kids getting hurt. How are they going to get feedback from from doing something if they don't get hurt? Um, like. Yes, three of them were riding around an old mobility scooter this afternoon, and and they're obviously like kids test limits, they push limits, and they were like turning it like this and this and this. They tipped it over, they rolled it, and two of them kind of got squashed and hurt a little bit. They had a bit of a cry because I think it was the shock as it fell over. Had a cut off from mum, and then Monty was like more, and like they, they just got back up and did it again. And they ran over a bird bath, and the bird bath was a heavy concrete socket. But they just they had fun, and and often now when when I when I see my kids doing something, I'm like, wow, are they going to die? Are they going to cause a a lot of damage to the house? No, most of the time parents get upset about kids spilling water. Like I know I've reacted to that in the past and I'm sure you guys have too, just spilling water. Like don't do that, da, da, like it's a crime. It's like, come on, it's just water. Really? Or milk, you know, it's not that bad. Or, or messy eating food at the table, food on the floor. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right, well, I wanted to just quickly finish off with for you why is it so valuable to be your best self as a dad like what do you get out of being your best what is, what is the reward for you 
What is the reward for me as a dad? For, to be a healthy dad, to have yourself in good shape mentally, physically, emotionally. How does it make you feel? I, I guess I've been doing it for... My food journey started when I was 20, but it makes me feel... It makes me feel good. Like, to me, this is normal. When I get reminders of eating shit, and I'm like, I feel like ass. I have... It drops my motivation. It makes me feel weak. It makes me feel sore. It makes my brain not work. And I'm like, if that's the alternative, it's not worth it. So... To be to to eat a little bit of fasting, to eat mostly meat, bit of fruit, a and train dense. You know, like you probably you guys probably hear this all the time from um, Jordan and Keegan or whoever, but it's so simple to look after yourself. You just have to do it. And I was thinking the other day when you know, I was, I was reading the two girls um, a story and like one had there, she's lying on this shoulder, one other was lying on this shoulder. And like I probably, I my body fat's been down to 5% in the past, but I feel, usually feel better when I'm between like 8 and 10. 8 and 10 is good for me. And I'd like to think that if I look after myself like this and I associate with people like, Jordan and you guys that look after yourself, that that's the type of male that my daughters are going to seek out. They're not going to, they're not going to go for anyone that um, doesn't look after themselves or doesn't educate themselves or, or doesn't put themselves first because they know if they do, then they're going to be looked after better um, and they'll have more respect for their future husband. Because I don't know about you guys, but if I see someone that anyone I look at that's overweight, the my it's like if there was like respect levels that hovered above everyone's head. If they were overweight, didn't look after themselves, it would be down here. If I see um, someone who who stands tall and is quite, you know, is quite jacked, I'm like my respect level goes up here because I understand the discipline, the work the effort that they're put into to live in that state. And those are the type of people I like to be around. 100%. 100%. And it's, it's such a positive environment for your kids to be around as well when you're when you're that kind of person as well. Hmm. Awesome. Fellas, any, uh, anyone got any questions? Maybe a couple of minutes. Anyone thinking anything while he was speaking? Yeah. Uh, Peter, in the beginning, you mentioned uh, unschooling. You were thinking about unschooling your kids. Can you elaborate a little bit about that? Like what's going on? Um... We have a, our firstborn, she's, she's six, nearly six and a half. Our second is, she'll be four in January and Monty will be two on Christmas. Um, and when Ruby went to school, we noticed a behavioral change. And um and then you hear some of the how her behavior has changed over the time and what stuff they get exposed to at school. And she just does not look forward to going to school. She doesn't really fit in that well at school. And I'm like, you hear about how the schooling system is now. And I'm like, I don't want my kids in that environment. I don't believe that is a good environment for my kids to learn and grow into who my kids into who my kids are. Like the the way I see humans, they get more messed up the more they get educated, or the more time they are dictated to by you need to know this, or you need to be tested on how good your memory is. If my children can communicate with words. So that can be different languages um, and writing and speaking. If they can communicate with words and numbers, problem solve and be creative, I don't believe they need anything else. So if I can put my kids in an environment where they can do that, again, I don't know how it's going to work, but uh, I know there's a lot of other people in my situation that are like, the schooling system is so messed up, it's I like I went through it. It didn't make sense to me. 
it's worse than New Zealand here now where they this I don't know it's all this gender and identification stuff is different in every country but when they are making it open for kids to choose what they are and keeping that information from the parents I'm like no nah. that happening you're not you not you are not coming between you're not breaking the bond between me and my kids. You can go and get stuff. They're like, I'll pull my kids out of school now. Um so when this next one is born, whether I've finished my building qualification or not, because that isn't as important as looking after my kids and my family. Does that help? I want to chuck that over to Dion quickly because he's in the school system. What What is your perspective? How long have you been a teacher for, Brad, mate? 20 years. Yeah, I've been a teacher for 20 years. How, have you seen a change in the school system? Um, yeah, it swings and moves. Um, depends on depends on the direction of uh, what's required with the curriculum. Um, and... In Australia, it's been state-based curriculums, national-based curriculums. Um, as Pete said, the um, big move with um, gender identification and diversity is a massive thing here in Australia. Um, there is a lot of aspects where, well, in our particular school, we're, we're very open with um, what's happening, I guess, for the families at home and that sort of stuff. Um, I a bit like Pete. I got a got my youngest. He's uh, he's actually had a, just had a fucking fuck of a day at school today. Um, he's going into year nine, so um, he's your classic. He's your classic lad, I guess. Um, he will do really good things, but school system's not gonna not gonna get him where he will get. Um. Like on the weekend, I didn't see him all weekend because I gave him the gave him the fishing boat, dumped him down the river, and he brought home dinner every night. Um, left him down there for about eight eight nine hours with a few mates and an esky and fishing rods, and they come home with fresh fish every night. So he's that type of kid that, yeah, the current school systems because it's all about academic progress, standardised testing, and I know that's sort of what I work in, um, but. Um, Pete raised the creativity part. Like it, there is fuck all opportunity for kids to really be creative in a school environment because your um, dictated is probably the right word because the powers that be of whoever designs the curriculum say this is what kids have to learn. Um, there are schools out there doing different things and they're becoming more and more um, popular and there's more of them. Um, but yeah. There's, there's shit that kids have to be have to learn that means fucking nothing to them. Mm. And they won't make sense of it because even sometimes the teachers who are teaching it to them are a bit like, well, why do why are we fucking doing this? You gotta like to be honest, I can say at times I will have scratched my head and gone, I don't even really know why I'm being made to teach this. And there's there's a problem in that. Yeah. And do you think do you think the school system shapes shapes a lot of the how actually i'll ask the question differently how do you feel the current system supports if it does in any way the results that we're seeing now in mental health physical health personal awareness personal development skills do you think it influences the school systems currently influencing the way people are thinking um yeah it probably is um like i'm I teach in a few different sectors. I'm a PE teacher. I teach um, I teach a lot of kids who follow also the trade pathway um, at the senior end. Um, and like you look at physical fitness in a school environment, our, our PE hours, our minutes, or we talk in minutes, our PE minutes have been getting dwindled down year after year after year. Um, like year nine and year nine and ten and eleven and twelve, so four years of secondary schooling. There's no compulsory physical activity. Like if a kid doesn't want to do physical activity, they can manipulate their subjects to do no physical activity in the last four years of their schooling, education. And they're there six and a half hours a day, five days a week. 
Um, so there's bits and pieces like that. Um, there is more push towards um, or vet vocational studies and things like that for kids now. There's a lot of kids doing vet studies, so following trade pathways and applied learning, and that's a big win um, because kids are actually coming out with qualifications and, and starting trades and things like that. There's a, there's, a, there's a swing back that way now with a lot of kids um, and schools, so that is a positive that that stuff is accessible, um, but that's probably only 5 to 10% of the kids going through schools that are sort of going to that applied direction. Mm. Most of them, because of what uni universities want, you need a score. You need a number because the number means everything. Mm. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big, uh, it's a massive decision for you, 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 Pete, and your family to, you know, be taking your children's education into your own hands. But I think it's also, it's not only a massive decision, it's a very important decision. Uh, you know, I've got a couple of dads around me who homeschool, their families are homeschooled. Kids are awesome. They're super well equipped in the areas that they've wanted them to become equipped. They've started their own businesses. He's taught them to start their own, you know, they've, they've had yeah. to go out and create business ventures. And he says, you know, whatever you, whatever you can make out of this business, I'll double it. I'll match it. You guys can save that or invest it. You know, there's different ways, but then I've also got other around so many families who are in the school system as well. And they say, you know, they get friends and they get this and that. It's like, it's a big decision, eh? Well, it can be viewed as a big decision. But when you feel strong, so strong about something, there's no decision. It's just that it's a, the, the alternative isn't an option. So this, you know, it, it just like when I had burnout with the gym, it was like I was spending three hours in bed in the afternoon to try and get through. It's like, wow, if this is how it is, then this isn't how it's going to be. It's got to stop. So sometimes those heart, those those what might be viewed as big decisions, they they're just black and white. And like, there's no reason why, you know, if your kids can problem solve, be creative, there's no reason why they can't start a business when they're 13, 14, or fifteen. They're big enough and old enough and smart enough and seen enough shit around the world or just problems in their own world to fix and solve. We don't need someone else to tell our could our kids about whether they're good or bad. Um, or they're at a certain level. Like the, the the schools here at the moment, it's like they the teachers get so much stuff uh, put on them. They are working to the lowest person, and that's it. And I'm like, no way. Like I was after school, I got accepted to Smithy Station, which is like a cadet training farm. So it got this farm got given to the Crown in 1931 with the primary purpose of training young blokes with farm skills so kind of like the body time chamber in a way it was men only boys only um there's no alcohol there's no drugs um it's a two-year two-year course where there's a buddy system with a senior and a junior and it's probably the most unique learning environment that i have lived in because every bloke there wanted to be better for everyone else and if someone dropped off, it was everyone else's job or duty to pick them up. And I haven't been in that environment since. Now, when I when I put my stuff out to the universe, you know, I guess you come across dudes like Jordan and Keegan Smith and the young comments like, oh, I found my people again. But again, it's a it's a different type of different type of environment. But if I can if I can create an environment for my kids and if other people can see the environment that my kids are in and how they're growing and they're like well fuck i want that environment for mine so maybe they could come and join in and we can do teamwork because it's always everything is always better together right when you've got someone else to leverage off or different families and different skill sets you can grow further when you do stuff by yourself it's a battle and it's so much easier to stop mm. I think that's, that, that's very inspiring, Peter, um, because last night I had the talk with my wife. Um, our oldest is six years old and she started school in first grade in September. And we also recognized a behavioral change. And we sent her to a private school and it's Montessori school. So it's very child centered and they do a lot of stuff and they're the teachers are 
very positive, but still it's cool. And what I don't like in this uh, environment is they concentrate only on failure. So they tell you what the child is not good at. And that that's not how it should be. Um, and so last night we had a, a long talk, my wife and I, we were talking about unschooling and what, what kind of possibilities we have. And you mentioned the, the feeling if you need to act, to do something, uh, act on it. Um, so yeah, I, I might uh, rethink that and, and like think over that again and do something. Don't, th in this don't think. Don't, th yeah. you don't need to think about it. You've already made the decision. You just need to do yeah, it. Yeah, because I have the feeling. Yeah, I I know this school is not the place where I want my daughter to be. It's yeah. it's it's not gonna be get better, even if I talk to the teachers and the head of the school, and it's not gonna change. So I have to take action and take her out of this environment and and find something else, even if I don't know how I can do it right now. But yeah, well, we'll see. We will. <laughs> Powerful, uh, powerful way to finish, I think. And, you know, Rob, if you want to connect with, if any of you lads want to connect with Peter, just send him a message on Instagram. You know, we, uh, we've got a strong network connecting with each other. And it's this is what's also such a benefit of it is we you meet more men, we get more relationships, be able to relate to people in different areas of life. You know, it's, it's so crucial to build that network outside of your mates or maybe your schoolmates or, you know, whatever, your colleagues. Have that community of men around you. And it's... Super important. So yeah, mate, thank you so much for jumping on. I know it's super late over in New Zealand and uh, even us us down in Victoria on the AEDT, we're an hour ahead as, as well. So yeah, we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up there. But fellas, unmute yourselves and you can say goodbye to Pete and thank him. And uh, yeah, get after it. Another week ahead. Thank you, Pete. Thanks for being here and sharing with us, bud. Appreciate your time. That's right. Thank you. Yeah, so, solid, uh, solid stuff. I love it. I don't know how you do it for kids, brother. I don't know, but uh, great, great stuff. <laughs> Look after yourself. Yeah, man. That's uh, that's key. That's for sure. Awesome stuff. All right, fellas. Speak to you soon. Let's keep getting after it. Right. Thanks, Pope, for joining us. Righto. See you, fellas. Thanks, Pete. See ya.